Right, so I've been absolutely busting a gut for the last couple of weeks doing some of the most fiddly, hardest experiments I've done in my life with liquid ammonia, which is thoroughly obnoxious stuff to work with. That being said, there were some really interesting moments with a very cold liquid ethanol bath. Well, this is just kind of fun. Right. What I've got here is that's actually ethanol at, oh god, minus... Minus 63. And this is what happens when you spray liquid ammonia into a vacuum chamber in a jet, is you actually get these little, little lines of frozen ammonia forming. So yep, that ammonia rice there is at minus 70 degrees Celsius in an almost space-like vacuum. And yet probably the only place this sort of thing happens naturally in our solar system is on the outer planets, far away from the sun where it's cold, like Uranus and Neptune. And if you want to feel for just how distant and remote these planets and moons are, you can watch them with a fairly powerful telescope over the period of an entire night and see what you see. What's impressive is not the motion of the moons, which is quite apparent, especially with the close orbiting Miranda, but the dynamism of the planet moving against the background stars. You see, with the naked eye planets, they tend to be so bright that they wash out the nearby stars. Not so with a very distant and very faint Uranus. But now, for a bit, I'm back. So video making time. Now, on my last video, I got loads of questions about why I was making my antimatter bullets out of anti-iron. I mean, surely I should have been using more traditional bullet-making materials like copper or lead, or anti-copper and anti-lead. Well, there's a problem with that. You see, making these larger nuclei takes an astronomical amount of energy. Well, kind of. So when you start, you got to start small with hydrogen or anti-hydrogen because it's the only thing we even stand a remote chance of making in our colliders. When you start off, let's say, with two heavy hydrogen atoms and you knock them together to make a helium atom, it actually releases a lot of energy. Now, this fusion process is exactly the same whether it's matter or antimatter. The only difference is with antimatter, the nuclei are negatively charged. Whereas, of course, with our regular matter, the nuclei are positively charged. And, of course, the uh, minor difference that the absolute cheapest antimatter that you will ever find is about $60 trillion per gram. So how does fusion work with regular matter? Well, to get those two positive nuclei so close together that they'll actually fuse requires an obscene amount of energy. I mean, here, this is platinum heated to 1,000 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that's quite hot. But what temperature do you have to heat your hydrogen to in order that it will fuse? About 100 million Kelvin. And this is one of those cute instances where two of the four forces that govern our universe are directly relevant. You see, it's the electromagnetic force that's responsible for the repulsion of the positively charged nuclei. But once you get over that barrier, it's the strong force that's responsible for binding the nuclei together and releasing all of that energy that you get from fusion. As the positively charged nuclei get to close together, they gain potential energy, which is akin to going uphill. And so you need an awful big run-up to get over that hill. How much of a run-up? About 100 million Kelvin worth of energy. However, once you get over that hill, you release even more energy than that. Now, doing this sort of thing is actually quite hard. In fact, there are only a couple of ways of doing it outside of a core of a star. Like, say, for instance, hitting it with very large lasers or smashing the nuclei together in accelerators. The problem with doing this with antimatter, of course, is if at any point those nuclei come into contact with the walls of your accelerator, it will annihilate and you'll have to start all over again, which is why the heaviest antimatter nucleus created thus far is anti-helium. I mean, hell, even if you're starting with regular matter, we've not done much better. However, there's a second problem. You see, you can get up to about iron just by fusion because you get more energy out than you put in. However, after that, it becomes more favorable for the nuclei to break into smaller fragments than to stick together. Now, curiously, the way that almost all elements larger than iron are made in our universe is through a supernova. 
an outburst at the end of a large star's life where it'll release almost as much energy as the entire galaxy for a few days. Now, some 20 million years later, that light's just about to reach the Earth. Indeed, it's shining on me right now. The telescope's pointing right at it. It's just, you can't see it yet because it's lost in the late evening twilight. However, later, in the full dark, I'm going to show you that supernova. It's actually up there in the Big Dipper. Ursa Major, and it's a fairly bright galaxy as galaxies go, M101. That is, if you can actually currently see the Big Dipper, then you're being bathed in the light of one of the most violent explosions that the universe can conjure. Now, by chance, I'd actually taken a picture of this galaxy about a month ago, and went out there a couple of nights ago to get a picture of this phenomenal firework. Indeed, by some reckonings, it's the closest Type 1A supernova for some 40 years but it's only just beginning. The point where I may yet well be able to show you this thing live from the eyepiece and not these minutes to hours long exposures. In fact, this is a time lapse of one of the largest supernovas in modern times in a galaxy merely some 20 million light years away. Now, when the supernova happens, it pumps out a lot of neutrons. Now, and some of those neutrons are captured by the surrounding nuclei, then decay via beta decay to give you a proton and move you up the periodic table. With the supernova due to the high neutron flux, this process is really quite rapid. Therefore, it's called the R process. The downside of this, of course, is it's almost impossible to get a supply of neutrons outside of a supernova because neutrons outside of the nuclei have a half-life of about 10 minutes. And when they decay, they release a crazy amount of energy. But let's just say, for instance, that I give you a bottle of anti-neutrons, and somehow I've managed to stabilize them against the beta decay. How are you going to hold them? I mean, nuclei are not too bad because they're positively charged, so you can hold them in an electric field. However, neutrons have no charge. So if you try and hold them by, say, grabbing hold of them, you'll get an instant antimatter explosion of megatons in scale. If, however, you don't grab them, there's no way you can stop them from falling under gravity. And when they hit the ground, boom, antimatter explosion of megatons in scale. So while the calculations for making an antimatter bullet out of iron is probably the entire aggregated revenue of mankind, all of that aggregated wealth probably couldn't buy you a single nuclei of anti-lead. And this was the key reason why, in my example, I went for anti-iron bullets. Not that it would really make that much difference anyway, because the antimatter annihilation basically scales with the mass you annihilate. So a 10 gram anti-lead bullet would release almost exactly the same amount of energy as a 10 gram anti-iron bullet. It's just that the anti-lead bullet would cost inconceivably more than the anti-iron bullet. I told you it would be absolutely, totally, and in all other ways, inconceivable. And yes, this does mean that getting shot by an anti-lead bullet would be the absolute most expensive way of getting killed. Except maybe for a, a neutronium bullet. But that's a story for another video. This time I'm going to hit it with full phasers at point-blank range. Sensors show the object's hull is solid neutronium. A single ship cannot combat it. As always, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you really like stuff like this, remember, subscribing is no longer enough to make sure that videos like this appear in your feed. You've got to hit that notification bell. And if you really like this video, you can support this channel directly through Patreon.